Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and happy Friday. We have a great, great show lined up for you today. There's so many things I wanna get into. And we have one of our very favorite guests, so good combo. The reaction continues following the death of football star and murderer, O.J. Simpson, and some of the media have spun some absurd analyses of his legacy. Speaking of media, MSNBC continues to go all in on the threat of Donald Trump and how his movement hates everything about our country. That's how they understand MAGA, a group of people that hates everything about America. And the law school dean at UC Berkeley hosted a dinner for students at his home only to be interrupted by a pro-Palestinian protester who was there at his invitation and in a surprise to no one, she is now playing the victim. We will play you her out and out lies about the encounter and show you the actual videotape of the encounter so you can see it for yourself. This is the playbook. Go do something obnoxious. When you get called out on it or held to account for your behavior, play the victim and if possible, sue and go public with your scurrilous allegations against the person you have targeted. Uh, here to discuss it all and more, my co-star, in the soon to be launched series, Mr. Burcham, Adam Carolla, host of the Adam Carolla Show podcast. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. I want to tell you about Gen 90, the latest breakthrough in skincare from our friends at Genucel. Those bags under your eyes from lack of sleep, being overworked, stress, and even those seasonal allergies that come with spring weather, Gen 90 can help. It also helps around the eyes, the forehead, crow's feet, laugh lines, even the chin, and it starts working in seconds. Gen 90 technology is luxurious. It's silky smooth. And now you can get Jenny Cell's classic under eye bags and puffiness serum with every Gen 90 order and also get their luxurious Jenny Cell XV. That's a collagen building moisturizer with vitamin C and hyaluronic acid in a pure natural base for stunning results day after day. <clears throat> Go to JennyCell.com right now for incredible packages, over 50% off during JennyCell spring sale, results guaranteed or your money back. Plus get an extra 10% off automatically applied at checkout. JennyCell.com slash MK60. JennyCell.com slash MK60. Order right now and get a free limited edition spa box with bonus gifts and free shipping. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash M-K-6-0. Adam, hi. Hi, thanks for having me back on. You're like my TV spouse. I know, if only life imitated art. <laughs> You're so sweet. Um, okay, so more on Bircham later, but we've, we've got to start with OJ. You're a California guy in all your travels out there. Did you ever meet him? Did you ever have any encounters with him? No, I grew up a fan of his. I was a big football fan when I was a young man. And, you know, he was the first kind of superstar. And he was the first guy that was black and palatable to mainstream America. You know, like Jim Brown was a great running back in the NFL as well. But he was too sort of headstrong and outspoken and wasn't considered good for mainstream America. But O.J. was the first and he was beloved by by all. I mean, you know, the notion that, you know, he was set up by the cops and it was a racist thing and everything else is is insane because he was at at the height of his powers, probably one of the most beloved Americans on the planet. That's right. And we were talking about this yesterday about how everyone fell in love with him. And much to the consternation of many in the black community, he disowned his blackness. He said, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And he was making it in, you know, what many considered it to be a white man's world, trying to be a guy who just got judged on the basis of his character and not to lean into any social justice issues or whatever we were calling him back then. And he was making it. He was multimillionaire. He was beloved. He was probably one of the most popular people on earth. I was just saying to my friend who's 32, um, 
you have to understand, this would have been like Tom Brady getting arrested for double murder. Like, he was that beloved, successful, friendly, you know, outwardly seeming like jo jovial and jolly. And then suddenly you get the news that he's allegedly murdered his ex-wife and, and a friend. And, you know, the coverage of this, Adam, has been so ridiculous. Like, it, it wasn't, yes, it was 30 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. The people writing the AP news headlines could do with a simple Google search enough to figure out he was a double murderer and avoid headlines like, and I'll just give you a couple. Here's the AP. Uh, actually, I'll start with NPR. Breaking news. The football great Orenthal James Simpson, known as OJ, has died. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing about the AP, and we'll get into the stories of the young black man who was shot by the police, and we can break down that game film. But what you need to understand with all the major news outlets as it pertains to race is they have two jobs. They have build up black. If it's a cop shooting, then make a big deal out of it. If it's a bad cop shooting against a white or it doesn't fit the narrative, then they tamp it down. And so they do it with all stories and all stories of race. So I was looking at it the other day, which was uh, a few months ago. I can't remember if it was Bobby or or another hockey legend died, but they started it with controversial uh, racist comments and then got to the part where he was in the Hockey Hall of Fame. That's a great way point. Down the road. And so if you look at some of the white great athletes or luminaries who have died and you look, read these AP or USA, whatever, it starts off with some sort of controversial racist thing, because obviously these guys had their heyday in the 50s and the 60s and they said something stupid when they were drunk. And that's what they started with. So with OJ, you slide murder down below the fold. And if it's Bobby or you slide racist up to the lead. That's so true. Like Roseanne is in our special, our, our comedy show, your comedy show that I'm co-starring with you in, uh, Mr. Burcham. You think they'd give her the same treatment? They're going to put in the first line many, many years from now when Roseanne passes the comments that she made that ended her show, the reboot of her show. She won't get any lovely NPR headline, or I'll give you the AP one. Legendary athlete, I mean, come on, legendary athlete, actor, and millionaire, colon. O.J. Simpson's right. murder trial lost him the American dream. You see, it was the right. trial, Adam, that did right. him and the unjust right. trial of him, not the fact right. that he almost cut his ex-wife's head off. Yeah, well, they do this with with everything like they'll go, you know, COVID cost California small businesses $10 billion. It wasn't COVID that cost it. It was unnecessary shutdowns and closures. It was the reaction of the governor of California or whatever blue state you're in. But it wasn't COVID because COVID hit Florida and Disney World stayed open and COVID hit California and Disneyland shut down. So it wasn't COVID, it was the reaction to COVID. But yes, they're, they're wordsmithing. It's very interesting. You have to really keep your eye on it. I don't think most people notice the wordsmithing. That, of course, is ridiculous. And if that was a white ball player versus a black ball player, then they would have slid the trial and they wouldn't have said trial, they would have said murder, and they would have slid it up to the top. Or like I said, any any racist transgression, they'll slide it to the top, and then all the 15-time all-star stuff will be way, way down the line. So it's all part of a kind of a general massaging. And it's not so undifferent than, you know, when they're looking for white national Christians or whatever such nonsense or what, you know, you know, when they say the biggest threat this country faces 
is uh, white supremacy. All right, well, then, then they go find it and then they start massaging the stories. And if a black guy punches an Asian lady on the streets of Manhattan, they tamp that one down. And if a white guy protests out front of a abortion clinic, then they build that one up. It's all part of the building up and tamping down. It's not just build up or tamp down. It's kind of both. Yeah, oh, it's like every other day in the news or on, on my X feed, you see some group beat down by black students or black youths on a white kid. Uh, most recently in Connecticut, we just saw this circulating uh, in a, a park, happened just the other day. The white girl had uttered a racial slur. Nobody's gonna defend that. But the beat down looked like they were trying to impose the death penalty on her. I mean, the rabid rage unleashed on this girl. Then of course we saw another girl get almost murdered uh, in the same circumstances. That doesn't get put on loop by the media because it doesn't fit the narrative. They, can, they don't know how to explain, honestly, what looks like subhuman behavior by these assailants on these victims. They don't wanna talk about it, but if the races were reversed, it would be everywhere. Yes, and for some reason, if there's a black and a white and the white puts his hands on the black, it is racist and it's a hate crime, even though it, there could be context to it. Maybe there's a traffic altercation or someone tried to hurt somebody or something like that. But in their world, there's no such thing as a black-white interaction that's not racist unless it's multiple blacks trying to kill one white girl, in which case it has no application racially. So really their own measuring stick is bent into a pretzel, if you really think about it. Like if, if you go like, well, look, um, they hate bad cop shootings, right? That's the number one thing they complain about is bad cop shootings. Okay, well then what about when cops shoot a white guy? Is that something you're bothered by? No, it's not something we're interested in. So their own yardstick for measuring this stuff is completely warped. And obviously they have an agenda and their agenda is to agitate and they're essentially going to cause a race riot. Like if they're not careful and they already kind of have, I mean, they they've done it with George Floyd in many other cases, but they're essentially baiting America into a race riot. That's They'd love essentially it the news is doing, yeah. So today so today, there was this woman on CNN who has it so backward, all right? So now it's gone, I read you the AP and the NPR, we could keep going. There are a lot of other headlines which are just ridiculous too. The New York Times um, had a doozy. But CNN puts on a commentator who used to work for Biden and Obama and she takes it next level. She basically suggests, unless we do something about, you know, we have this, conversation about race that we've apparently never had. I guess we didn't even have it no. in the wake of George Floyd. You're gonna get a lot more OJ Simpsons. She listened to this incredible soundbite. It's not like OJ Simpson was the, the leader of the civil rights movement of his era. You right. know, he wasn't a social justice leader, but he represented something for the black community in that moment, in that trial particularly because there were two white people who had been killed. And the, the history around how black people have been persecuted um, during slavery, there were, there were just so many layers. And I guess I would just close with this, is that there was racial tension then, there is racial tension now. It might not be the backdrop of the Trump campaign, but until this country is ready to actually have an honest conversation about the racial dynamics from our origin story till today, we will always have moments like O.J. Simpson that manifest, and our country will always be divided if we don't actually deal with the issue of race. Wait, what? <laughs> what? Uh, she, first of all, uh, she brings up the race of the victims. She points out that somehow he represented something for the black community, particularly because he killed two whites. So that makes the black community more, what, empathetic in her view? To OJ because okay, and then she she lands it with we're always going to have moments like OJ Simpson that manifest if we don't have this honest conversation. So I guess the whites are going to have to get used to all, the whole murder thing unless we get real frank about DEI. Yeah, it's uh, fairly insidious. 
I you know it always cracks me up, though. The group that always starts talking about having an honest conversation about race. All right. So let's like break that statement down. OK, so we're having conversations about race, but we're not having an honest conversation about race. So you want an honest conversation about race. The only honest conversation there is about race is stop having kids out of wedlock. Stay home. Dads raise your kids. Intact family, family and education. That's about it. It'll work with all races. It would be an honest conversation for all races. The races that do the least of it are doing the worst in our society. So now we're done with our honest conversation about race, except for you and none of your so-called leaders ever want to have that conversation, which is the only honest conversation about race. The rest of the race discussion is window dressing. That's just, well, should we get a black DA? Should we get a black police chief? Um, should we lower test scores? What about systemic racism? Uh, what about bridges? We should rename bridges and tear down statues. That's, that's all superfluous sidebar stuff. Uh, the only honest conversation is the family, the intact family, dad staying in and raising kids, focusing on family and education. And that's the honest conversation they never want to have about race. Interesting. Mm -hmm. To me, it's so infuriating to watch them try to recast the O.J. double murder case as right, just about the race. I mean, yes, we all saw that play a role in the trial. That's why he was acquitted. We know that. But they don't want to talk about what he did, what happened, about the travesty that he unleashed on his family and these two innocents. And I went back uh, Adam, and I pulled this because, you know, you and I are old enough to have lived this firsthand when she was murdered along with Ron Goldman. For the young people listening, she was OJ's ex-wife. There had been a long history of domestic violence. And then she went out to, they had seen each other at a ballet rehearsal for her daughter that er, that earlier that day. Something ticked him off. We, I don't know exactly what it was, but something about her got to him at that thing. It wasn't like they had some open conflict or she showed up with another man, even though they were already divorced. And he came to her house that night and murdered her. But he ran into Ron Goldman, who she had seen at a restaurant, and she had left her glasses behind. He was coming over to drop them back off to her. And he murdered them both, so said a civil jury. And um, they're forgetting. Like, they're forgetting how brutal the crime was, how it was in cold blood right in the middle of the, you know, mid-evening. And I went back and pulled, just so that people understand the, the severity of this guy, the um, 911 call, one of them, there were many, that shows her terror um, when he was abusing her. Take a listen here. 911 emergency, Can you get again. someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back. Please. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. <laughs> he just somebody drove up. Over. Okay, wait a minute. What kind of car is he in? He's in a white Bronco, but first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. So what is he doing? Is he threatening you? <laughs> I'm going nuts. Okay, has he threatened you in any way, or...? Or is he just harassing you? You're going to hear him in a minute. He's about to come in again. Okay, just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. He's going to beat the shit out of me. Wait a minute. Does he have any weapons? I don't know. Okay. He went home. Now he's back. Okay. My kids are up there sleeping, and I don't want anything to happen. Okay. He broke the whole back door in. And then he left, and he came back? And he came, and he practically knocked my upstairs door down, but he pounded it, and then he... I screamed and hollered and I tried to get him out of the bedroom because the kids are sleeping in there. Okay, okay, the okay, 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 And, you know, Denise Brown, her sister, would go on to say, we have to start talking about domestic violence for what it is. These are future murder victims. These are potential future murder victims. That's what happened to her. And all these so-called, you know, AP and the NPR, I'm sure they'd be quick to lecture us on women's rights and domestic violence and how bad men are in general. What? Unless you're O.J. Simpson and you happen to be a black man, in which case after 30 years, we'll just focus on your football.
Well, I mean, they always talk about women's rights and domestic abuse and stuff, but uh, they don't really care. I mean, you know, it's all that queers for Palestine and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, they're all they all just talk. They're not really interested in the actual abuse part. But it is, you know, it's an it's an interesting psychological experiment. Uh, OJ is in that. He grew up in a housing project in San Francisco, and he grew up on the mean streets and probably ran in some pretty tough circles and probably saw a lot, was probably exposed to a lot, may have been abused and so on and so forth growing up. But his aesthetic was so pleasing. He had such a nice look to him and his tone was so unarming and so pleasing that we as biological creatures sort of looked at him and went, oh, okay, he's good. He he, he wouldn't put his hands on anybody. Listen to the way he speaks. Look at the way he looks. You know, he just didn't fit the part. And we as human beings look at a guy like George Clooney And we look at a fat guy with three chins and we go, I bet that George Clooney guy's a better guy. And I bet he'd make a better airline pilot than the fat guy would based on completely just an aesthetic, you know, and OJ had the aesthetic and he had the smoothness and literally just the tone of his voice and his demeanor. And it made us all kind of go like, come on, he's a good dude. He wouldn't do anything. Uh, But he grew up in a tough environment He was an athlete. He probably was concussed a few times and he had all the reasons to do what he did as any murderer does. He just came in this sort of very palatable package. Mm, Gosh, you're right. And it's, I mean, yesterday we played a video of him from Instagram that he posted shortly before he died. It was like a month or two ago. And he still had that sort of jolly demeanor, very disarming, as you say. And that's what was so tricky about him. Like when you watch the the clip, you think, oh, the juice, he's such a nice guy. He's clearly seeking our approval and our friendship and, you know, our thumbs up and you want to give it. And then you remember who he really was. Uh, and, you know, I, I firmly believe he did something as profoundly evil as any man can do and that he's paying for it at this very moment. Um, two other things on OJ. Weirdly, some in the media... <laughs> This whole thing brought up Trump for them. (laughs) Okay. Um, First, the LA Times, the obit. Okay, first of all, the obit for OJ at most major media outlets would have been written long ago, should have been written long ago. They all, you know, having worked at many television places, I can tell you that as you get into like your mid seventies, and certainly when people know you have prostate cancer, as they knew about OJ, you get it ready. You get the package ready, you get the obit ready, apparently not at the LA Times. Uh, because their obit writer released the following in her initial piece. Long before the city woke up on a fall morning in 2017, Trump walked out of Lovelock Correctional Center outside Reno, a free man for the first time in nine years. He didn't go far, moving into 5,000 square foot home, a 5,000 square foot home in Vegas with a Bentley in the driveway. Now, what on earth would make Elaine Wu LA native who's been writing for this paper since 1983 and the obits writer, think of Trump when she decided to go back to OJ's criminal past. (laughs) To me, it's evidence that she's salivating about the prospect of Trump being in a correctional facility someday soon. And when the LA Times had to correct her obit, they changed it from Trump to Simpson with a note saying in an earlier version, we used, quote, the wrong name when describing him. All right, that's number one. And then here's number two, a little clip from The View, who also managed to work Trump into it somehow. For for me, the tragedy was the injustice, in my opinion. Which part, which injustice? The criminal trial. The the fact that he was not found guilty. Oh, yeah. Um, Oh, he was found liable later, civilly. Like Trump is found liable for rape. Yes, he was was the same thing. (laughs) Everything goes back to Trump. Um, he, he, until he's he gone, I will not rest. Liable for sexual assault. Same thing, Trump and OJ, basically looking at the same situation. 
Well, to be fair to the LA Times staff writer, in the LA Times computers, that's just a spell correct. Anytime you're writing a hit piece or so about someone nefarious, it just auto corrects <laughs> to Trump. So if you're <laughs> telling a story about uh, Bismarck or Pol Pot or um, <laughs> Hitler, it just it auto corrects to Trump. So if you're writing a story about Jeffrey Dahmer, Charles Manson, it will just come up with Trump. You get rid so of that manual override. Thing. Yeah, uh, obviously, it, it must. It's got to be an inter It's an interesting life for Joy Behar because she will be laying on her deathbed, possibly with prostate cancer. I don't know. I haven't checked, and in her world, <laughs> don't want to. She should have. Well, but she should also have every right to get prostate cancer as a male, according to her politics. So when she's lying in her deathbed several years from now, she can think back on the last 20 years of her life and realize she was obsessed with someone she basically never met who had no impact on her life, like a, an imaginary chupacabra that she obsessed with mm -hmm. for the last 20 years of her life named Donald Trump. And I think the joke is going to be on her. Hmm. Um, we'll wait for that. Maybe she'll see the light before that day comes. All right. Last thing on OJ. Yeah. There is a there's a weird thing online that I want to talk about. There is a conspiracy theory, and it's been around for a long time, since I became a public figure, that I am Nicole Brown Simpson, that she and I are actually the same person. This is a thing, you can Google it. And of course, it was all over the place yesterday. It was all over my mentions yesterday, people tweeting pictures of the two of us at me in my comments. And this is the first time I really went down the rabbit hole with any you know amount of time. And I have to tell you, it's amazing to me how many people have given real thought to this. They were having arguments about how it could be, how it might not be, about how I have like a more heart-shaped face and she had a more square jaw, about how somebody really needs to check me for the scars from like whatever operation I had to transform. I think the theory is I was, I am right now actually Nicole Brown Simpson, that I wasn't actually murdered, that somehow Hollywood staged this or did something to make it look like I had died. And then I came back as journalist, Megyn Kelly. And I guess also decided to make myself a public figure. I didn't decide to leave this, leave this quiet life, you know, having gotten away with this ruse. I decided to go back on the air under the name Megyn Kelly. And there was somebody online defending me saying, no, um, he, here's what he says. Hold on. He says, oh, here's, here's just some back and forth before we get to him. Okay, we've got to check for scars. Indeed, it was all fake. This is a bunch of different people weighing in. Her jaw is totally different. Can cosmetic surgery change a jaw? It can, but I've never had cosmetic surgery on my jaw. This is my natural born chin, madam. Um, I imagine the DNA must be on file. Then somebody responds, not a chance. I said this earlier, Megan Kelly dated my uncle for years while they were both at Syracuse. He's in her book. She used to babysit me. This is all total BS. You are correct into thin air. I am a real person with a whole independent history having nothing to do with Nicole Brown Simpson, who was very clearly murdered back in 1994. And I don't know what this says about us, Adam, but I do think it's important in our society to somehow try to maintain some distance between COVID starting in a lab is a conspiracy theory and you're a nutcase. And people who believe there are lizard people work, you know, walking amongst us and that I'm reincarnation or the current version of Nicole. Bar like, I do worry that like getting from the first group, which are not conspiracy theories, they're just labeled such, um, into the second group, which are genuinely unhinged beliefs. I don't know. Is, is that the path? Like, does one go from being called a conspiracy theorist into actual conspiracy theories? Or how and why is this happening to the second group? Well, it is interesting. You're right. If you create flat earthers and lizard people, 
and all that, then they will lump side effects from the vaccinations and lab origin or origin of the virus or people who uh, take ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, then you'll get lumped into the lizard person flat earther group, which as would be pretty effective if you were trying to throw a little mud and, and tarnish the reputation of somebody who believed in something that was real, like origins of COVID, uh, and then smear them. So there is something sort of diabolical about it. Uh, I feel your pain. I'm mistaken for Greg Brady of the Brady Bunch uh, quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of theories online as to whether there's two of us or just me. And then why would I go into media? But let's not make well, we this need a about, split screen of that. Uh, We're going to work on that. Please. Yeah, I don't it's very I mean, I'll give you some of the uh, let's see. I and mean, this is just fr from yesterday, but these pop up in my timeline all the time. Nicole Brown Simpson versus Megyn Kelly. Hollywood recycles dead actors. Why does Nicole Brown Simpson look exactly like Megyn Kelly? I don't think we look exactly like at all. She has brown eyes. I have blue eyes. There's a lot of differences between us. There's a vague resemblance. Is Megyn Kelly, Nicole Brown Simpson, and on and on. I am gonna put on this video some pictures of the young Megyn Kelly in Syracuse, New York, where I grew up. I was born in Illinois, I moved to Illinois. I have a long, or moved to Syracuse. I have a long history of being alive in my own skin under my own name, people. You gotta let it go. Focus on getting the help you need. Um, like go outside, smell the fresh air, get some rest, see real people, stay off the internet. I think that's the number one piece of advice. Stay off the internet. If you are prone to this kind of thinking, it's not your friend. All right, quick break, Adam. We will come back. There's so much more to discuss. I'm dying to discuss with you what, hap what happened at Berkeley. We're going to spend a chunk on that. Stand by. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Sadly, Delta was just one of so many animals that needed help. And this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill care for life animal sanctuary in the world. That's what you wanna hear, no kill, before you make any donations to any of these animal sanctuaries. These guys have rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, a real home. April marks 45 years since Leo rescued Delta. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to stay open. And if you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner because there are tax benefits to this. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. deltarescue.org. So Adam, you made reference to this situation in Chicago with a police officer involved shooting um, a man named Dexter Reed, 26 year old um, from Chicago was shot dead after he pulled a gun on cops and shot them and actually did shoot a police officer in the arm. Uh, and then the police responded that this is the at least initial information coming out from the authorities there, including a group that's charged uh, this civilian office of public of police accountability with investigating this kind of case. Amazingly, the media continues to raise the decedent's race. He was black. They don't mention the race of the cops. Most of them appear to have been black. Not relevant, right? Just assume white. And by the way, even if they're black, it doesn't matter, still racism. And also they continue to show Dexter Reed's high school graduation photo as though this is just this super sweet, clean cut kid who hasn't done anything wrong. He's just, you know, graduating from high school, living an upstanding life without mentioning, and it happened again today in the New York Times, without mentioning, he has a mugshot. And that's because he had multiple recent arrests, including gun charges, including including for having an unauthorized weapon. Um, we played the video yesterday of a neighbor's surveillance camera that appears to show him shooting 
out of the passenger side of his vehicle. The gun, the gun smoke comes out of the passenger side. The cop gets blown back, falls on his back, and it's on the right side of your screen. For those of you watching this on YouTube, you're, you're going to see the cops back up. Look, you see the cop fall down, and then the shootout begins. And they are reporting on this in a way that doesn't, in many cases, immediately make clear there's a reason the cops unleashed 96 shots in 41 seconds on a black man, as Washington Post used for its headline. He shot at them first. What do you make of it? Well, I mean, it's all part of the hustle, the race hustle. Um, It's why nobody really is into legacy news anymore. Uh, They're hurting their own cause when they lie this way. Um, You know, they have components of a story that they like, and then they have components of the story that are sort of troublesome to them. So the components of the story they like is they like the black man uh, being shot. They like the 96 shots and 41 seconds. They like the pulled over for a seatbelt violation. They like all that. Um, They don't like the part where he fired on the cops first, and they don't like the part where the cops were black and some were black and appear to be female as well from the video I think. So what they do when they write the story, when, uh, you know, L.A. Times, New York Times or legacy media or whoever the race hustlers are, write the story. They go, okay, let's put them all in the basket. What 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 do we like? Well, we like that he's black. Good. We like that he's young. Good. Um, He was uh, convicted for a gun charge. Okay, we don't like that. Get that out of there. We like a high school graduation picture. Uh, The guy who got choked out on the subway, who threatened everyone on the subway car. We liked that he was a Michael Jackson impersonator. Good. Get a picture of him dressed up like Michael Jackson. We're going to use that. Okay. We don't like the part where he fired on the cops first, so we'll get that out of here. We do like the multiple rounds fired by the cops, so we'll put that in there. And then we'll just build ourselves a little stew of lies. And that's how they roll. And the sad part is, is they could get away with it. And they did get away with it for a long time. But the problem is, is people is caught up to them and technology is caught up to them. There's video, you know, body cameras, ring doorbells and all that to dispute them. Because 20 years ago, they just would have said this and we all would have had to swallow it. So they're race hustlers. They're essentially trying to start a race war. Uh, They're married to some narrative. Uh, They go back to that well every time. And as we get closer to the election, I imagine they're going to keep trying to hustle this. Um, Mm. On the other hand, it's it's always to their own detriment because I don't think of them as news anymore. But it's amazing, like the, the misleading. The New York Times doesn't use the mugshot and doesn't even mention the prior arrests, Adam, which are, as you point out, one of them, not convicted, but arrested for aggravated unlawful use of a firearm. Like that was recent. That would be relevant to mention. (laughs) Where where is that? They pretend to hate guns, right? They pretend to hate guns, except for they don't care about the part where this guy was arrested for firearms and firing his gun at the cops so all they have 11 all the, rounds from the look of it yes they have they have a great disdain for guns except for they miss this part um as it pertains to this case and him having priors for having a gun so well so you have look, you have um the mayor we talked about this yesterday a bit but the mayor oh, brandon johnson uh, you saw worked. this he comes out well, as mayor and a father raising a family, including two black boys on the west side of Chicago, I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with police. Right. It is devastating. Yeah. Perhaps you should call on other young black men in the community not to shoot cops. It's a very, very good way not to have them shoot at you. Well, first off, he's such a race hustler. And this thing where you go, as a father of two black children, shut up, you ass. That's out of the Obama playbook. I know, I know. If I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon Martin. Stop race hustling all the time. It is is such a 
lack of fiduciary duty what these people do is literally trying to incite a race riot in yes. their in the city they govern over because right, right. you can't Good point any context you're literally in you're you're lighting a match and throwing it into kerosene in your own city you're trying to incite this he's a pompous ass he's a narcissist yes you have two black kids i have two white kids good we're even move forward focus on the case they do this every time uh, first off who would want to be a cop under these circumstances if this is the way you're going to be portrayed what would it do for recruitment obviously it's it's killing it and he is not fit to be mayor if that's his version of this story and by the way why is every single version the race riot version of every single one of these stories does anyone think like they yeah. at some point they'll do a retraction or apology where they go oh we got it wrong or we probably should have included this how come it's never at the beginning yeah, it, the uh, AP headline yesterday, deadly Chicago traffic stop where police fired 96 shots raises serious questions about use of force. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. If you know one critical fact that you didn't put in your headline, AP, here's the other thing. We're about two minutes from Benjamin Crump showing up in Chicago with Al Sharpton trying to gin this th thing up, if history's any guide. The mother of, the, of Dexter Reed, the 26 year old who died, took to the cameras yesterday. And here's a bit of that. He was a, a good kid. And why they did him like that, I just don't understand. Like he had just bought his new car three days before that. And he was just riding around in his car. He said, Mom, I'm going for a ride. And they killed him. They killed him. <laughs> Thank you. For the listening audience, she like kind of collapses, though unclear whether that was organic or orchestrated. I'm sorry, but to me that did not look real. It looked like she kind of crumbled for effect. I'm sorry that she lost her son. I think it's her son's fault. That's what I think based on the evidence so far. You don't want to, yeah. you shoot at the cop, every time he's going to shoot back at you. And they shoot to kill. If they have a deadly threat facing them, the law allows them to shoot to kill. The number of bullets returned, it's not even bullets, it's just rounds fired. That's not the number that hit Dexter Reed. It's, they're allowed to respond with to deadly force, force with deadly force. The, the question here is not about the number of bullets. Right, well, okay. So this is kind of the new world order. Um, she says all he's doing is driving around, minding his own business, uh, gets pulled over, and they kill him. And then if she says it with enough gusto and then collapses into the crowd, then we all go, oh, OK, <laughs> I guess I believe her. Um, and this is a very dangerous place we're at in a society. I mean, we just kind of went through it with COVID. A lot of emotion, a lot of people crying, a lot of people screaming about Nana at home and bringing it home to them. And then if they get enough emotion going and there's enough certitude in their voice, then we all just go, oh, OK. Yeah, OK. I guess that's what happened. Uh, she's a liar. Ben Crump, all these uh, ass swipe race hustlers are going to come in and lie. CNN's going to lie. And by the way, like AP... And we just learned about NPR, but a lot of these networks, I, I want to tell your audience this, you know, people always do this thing where they go, well, you got CNN over here and you got Fox over here and they kind of both do their own thing. Well, what about AP and what about Reuters and what about USA Today? And what about all these places you leave out who are clearly in the camp of the left? I mean, they all regurgitated this story the same way. These are people understand what Fox is doing and people understand what MSNBC is doing. But what they don't really understand is what USA Today and AP and Reuters are doing, yeah. which is lying as well. Yeah, you're so right. That's why the NPR expose written by this guy earlier this week was so telling because he's still on the inside. Uh, it was published at the Free Press and he came out with uh, an article all about his own organization. His name is Yuri Berliner, senior business editor, Worked at, has worked, continues to, at NPR for 25 years. And this piece is exposing 
how extensive the rot is inside of NPR, how everything is seen through a diversity lens. There's NPR, no R for the black employees. <laughs> My friend accurately pointed out, there's no NPR Blanc, Adam. <laughs> That's not a thing. <laughs> there's an affinity group for every kind of racial group. All of their coverage is seen through that lens. There are no conservatives, literally not one in at least the DC Bureau, and I'm sure it's true for most of NPR. Um, and yet they're publicly funded. They have government funding. Trump saying the other day, it, should, it ought to be rescinded. And now you've got the New York Times cleanup piece on it saying, okay, they've been accused of liberal bias. NPR in turmoil after it is accused of liberal bias as though it's just an allegation. And then they say that they've responded forcefully. They forcefully pushed back. And their evidence is to quote Edith Chapin, the organization's editor-in-chief, saying, quote, we believe that inclusion among our staff, with our sourcing, and in our overall coverage is critical to, sell, to telling the nuanced stories of the country and our world. That's not forcefully pushing back. That's admitting that you're obsessed with DEI instead of news, and you, as this internal guy, Yuri Berliner points out, haven't raised your minority viewership or reading uh, population by one person. They're still dirt low. No, They don't want to watch or listen to your publications any more than whites or Asians do? Well, a couple things. I experienced this firsthand, I think about 10 years ago, one of my books came out. I went to Manhattan. I was doing a media tour and I went down to NPR and I think I was on Brian Lair's show and I sat down and did a long interview with him, audio interview. And at the beginning of the interview, he tried to bust me because he played a snippet of my podcast where there was a stereotypical Asian voice being used. And he thought it was me. And he tried a gotcha moment at the beginning of the interview, which is, first off, thank you very much. I'm just sitting down to do an interview and we're here to talk about my comedy book, but you try your gotcha thing because you're NPR and you're woke. Fine. Uh, I had to inform him that that voice was Joe Coy, who is Asian, and that <laughs> was not me who was doing that voice. And he said, uh, I said, I appreciate what you're trying to do. You're trying to catch me, but you didn't catch me because you didn't do your research well enough. I was interviewing an Asian man who's a comedian who did an Asian voice. Uh, they then didn't air that video. Uh, oh, no way. And I should say they didn't air the interview. And then other people came in like John Waters, other authors came in and they would they played his his interview. And I kept contacting them saying, when are you going to play my interview? And uh, they said, we're doing a, a fun drive, a, a pledge drive. So we're not going to do it this week, but we'll do it next week. They never aired it. They buried it. And at the end, they said, you can come back to New York and redo it if you want. Oh. So here's here's what I'm going to say, NPR, and Brian Lair. And when you look these guys up, they're like respected journeyman journalists. You know, the truth is the beacon of light. You idiots got busted trying to bust me doing an interview. I came to you. I sat down to do an interview about my comedy book. You tried to bust me because you're retarded politics. You got busted and then you buried the tape and you've never aired it. Um, so that's the kind of journalism. And those are the kind of cowards and hypocrites you get over there at NPR. So I was aware of this many years ago. And here's the bottom line. 86, I believe, of the people on their editorial staff or Democrats with zero Republicans. But yep, they always claim like, well, that doesn't taint us and, or, or that doesn't change the way. Oh, okay, let's just say 86 of the people were vegan and there were zero meat eaters on that. Would you be doing glowing reviews of barbecue joints? Right. right well said. And on top of that, now they're saying they're blaming this guy saying, oh, the next time one of our people calls up a Republican congressman or something and tries to get an answer from them, they may well say, oh, I read these stories. You guys aren't fair, so I'm not going to talk to you. 
they're actually, that's their ma managing editor of standards and practices, trying to blame the likely reluctance of Republicans to deal with NPR after this on Yuri, as opposed to the actual content of what he's saying and the content that we hear from NPR all the time. It's like NBC saying, oh, now Republicans aren't gonna wanna come on after what we did to Ronna McDaniel. And that's somehow, I guess, Ronna McDaniel's fault. No, this, you have yourself to blame for this, folks. 100%. And, and look, it's all stuff we knew anyway, right? I mean, isn't all this stuff just yes. stuff we knew anyway? Like, oh, Russian collusion. Okay, there was nothing there. Hunter Biden's laptop was fake. Okay. Uh, COVID came from a wet market. Okay. Ivermectin's horse face. Okay. We all knew it. We all knew what they were doing. They were lying. And uh, there's a little game I like to play, Megan, called Stupid or Liar. So NPR got everything wrong. They got the Russian collusion wrong. They got everything COVID wrong. They got Hunter Biden's on. So are they stupid or are they lying? Because either way, you, you don't have to listen to that. I'm assuming they were lying. Yeah, they Or were. They, they weren't lying. And they're just the worst news outlet ever because they got everything wrong. They're lying. I mean, in, in Yuri's piece, he talks about how they're, they were openly saying, oh, I'm glad we're not going to cover the Hunter Biden laptop thing. That's good for Trump. That could help Trump. They're on a mission. The piece is absolutely stunning because we did know, but it's very juicy to hear it from an insider. All right, so much more to do. Adam stays with us. Quick break. Don't go away. So happy to have him here today. Adam Carolla for the rest of our show. Grand Canyon University, a private Christian university based in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, believes in equal opportunity and that the American dream starts with purpose. Change the world for good by putting others before yourself. Whether your pursuit involves a bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree, GCU's online, on-campus, and hybrid learning environments are designed to help you achieve your unique academic, personal, and professional goals. With over 330 academic programs as of September, GCU meets you where you are and provides a path to help you fulfill your dreams. The pursuit to serve others is yours. Let it flourish. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Debt. You can go to bed thinking about it and you can wake up thinking about it too. Here's the truth. The system traps you in debt. High interest credit cards and loans then make it nearly impossible to pay off the debt you have accumulated. And then insane inflation keeps you stuck paycheck to paycheck. It's just this ongoing cycle. Done with Debt can be your lifeline. Done with Debt has an ingenious new strategy to help erase your debt faster and easier than you ever thought possible. Done with Debt will analyze all the debt options that you qualify for. They know how to reduce bills and how to cut interest rates. Their skilled staff of negotiators, they know how to get debt out of your life permanently without bankruptcy and without a loan. Done with Debt has experts who can share with you strategies for eliminating debt, but you do need to hurry because some debt solutions are time sensitive. Here's how easy they make it. Go to donewithdebt.com. So easy to remember, donewithdebt.com, donewithdebt.com, check it out. So we pulled the Greg Brady pictures and I can see it. I got, I, I don't know, they're, they're reeling me in. Yeah, I see it. It's like the, the healthy eyebrow maybe, is that what it is? Yeah, I think I think it's the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought this up. <laughs> I lured you into it. That's, you know, you could do worse. He was a handsome guy, well liked. He was one of the best Bradys. Yeah, he's definitely top six Brady. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like you don't want to look just like. Jan Brady, that's uh, no no offense to Jan, but like that's not what you're going for. Um, okay, we've got to get into what's happening at UC Berkeley Law School. So this guy, Erwin Chemerinsky, who is the dean of, again, this is the law school at Berkeley, is, I should say, very well known in legal circles as a free speech expert. Like this is one of the main things he's known for. And he was at Duke for a while. He's been all over at these esteemed universities. And now he's out at UC Berkeley Law. Now, I need to lay the foundation for what we're about to see because he's Jewish and he's married to a UC Berkeley professor too. Uh, she's, I think, labor law, school of law. 
And um, after 10-7, he started to be subject to anti-Semitic attacks. Um, there was one that showed him, um, okay, it was, the, it was shared by the Berkeley Law Students for Justice in Palestine Instagram feed. They shared just on April 1st, a caricature of him, Chemerinsky, with a knife and fork and the slogan, no dinner with Zionist Chem, I think that's short for Chemerinsky, while Gaza starves. Look at him, like looking like, I guess the hungry Jew with his knife and his fork. Then there was a student at a town hall who told Chemerinsky that the only way she would feel safe would be for the school to quote, get rid of the Zionists. Then someone at his school posted a picture of him on Instagram with a caption indicating that he had taken an indefinite sabbatical to go join the Israeli Defense Forces. Okay, not true, but you see where this is going. And um, so then notwithstanding all of that, he hosts a dinner and he invites to his dinner this woman from Law Students for Justice in Palestine, which posted the Instagram thing that I just told you about. And her name is Mala Afane. She shows up along with 59 others, 60 students who show up. And I guess he does these little dinners in his backyard out there in Berkeley, you know, making himself feel good about reaching out, student outreach. It's so lovely. Well, Mala Kafina saw an opportunity, Adam. In the middle of the dinner, she whipped out her traveling microphone and watched the following exchange. Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings upon you all. Tonight, we are gathered here in the name of no, commemorating our final few weeks please as leave. law students. This is my house. Tonight my is guest. also the last night of the holy month of Ramadan, where millions of Muslims around the world fast. Not only from you material sustenance, fast not only from material sustenance, we have attorneys, we have attorneys. Okay, you don't have to get Excuse aggressive. Excuse me. I'm not please leave our house. You are guests at our house. This is our First Amendment right. No, this is our first it's amendment. not. It is. The National Lawyers Guild has informed us this is our First Amendment right. And they are aware of this. They are not wrong. This is my house. This is my house and you're no longer welcome here. You are not welcome. Okay, you can call the police. No, I don't. You can prefer call the you. police. I'm getting a please speech. stop touching her. Uh, Just no. please leave. If you don't want to be here, please leave please my leave house. On the blood of Palestinian people, I the UC don't. has committed sending two billion dollars to weapons manufacturers. To with what I know, and we're does. just giving a speech about please Ramadan and the holy please month. Leave my if house. you can grab me the mic back, I will leave. Good. Okay. But will you please give me the mic? Please, will you give me the mic back? Let me take. Let me turn it off. Please turn it off. I'll turn it off. You're not a guest. You're a guest of my house. I know, but forty thousand people are dying. Incredibly rude of you to abuse our hospitality in this way. Join us in walking out. There's a genocide going on. There's a genocide. Then don't come here. You haven't done anything about divestment. Please leave my house. Anything about divestment? I don't invest in anything. I'm not going to argue with you. This is a party. Anything. Islamic relations SF will be here how you pulled a Muslim woman's scarf during Ramadan. Putting your hands I on my hijab is unacceptable. By grabbing my arm, my you will hear from Karasa. You I will hear from Paligal. And them. the fact that your wife was able to assault a Muslim Palestinian hijabi student is she not great. Her. They Please leave the house. We are Please leaving. leave our house now. We are leaving. Not your we are leaving. Oh, my God. I love so it. So he's surprised that when he invited the head of the group that sent out the little picture of him with the knife and fork, no dinner with Zionist Kem while Gaza starves, she didn't behave well. <laughs> Shock. I'm shocked. She traveled with her hijab in her kafeya and busted out the Arabic with her alaikum salam to kick things off. <laughs> and you see Erwin Chemerinsky and his wife, melt down, notwithstanding, and we'll get to this, their very lengthy social justice warrior past. Till this moment, they've been very, very open on the student protest, not on Israel, but about 
you know, campus activism and BLM. And they, they were all in until this moment, which he accurately describes as very rude. And then we've got to get to what this uh, Mala Kafaya is now saying her revisionist history about what we just watched with our eyes. <laughs> but what's your reaction to that clip? Well, I would say to her, if you're anywhere in the Muslim world and you're female and you pull out a Mr. Microphone, you will be stoned <laughs> to death. So number one, That's they true. never really do that part where they always talk about how great their religion is. But if you tried any of that in a predominantly Muslim country, you would be stoned to death. So how great is that religion? I don't know. Why don't you go to head to Tehran and pull out Mr. Microphone and have a run? Let's see how it goes. Do, your, do an impromptu open mic in any majority Muslim country, and let's see how Mr. Microphone works out. Or you should call it Mrs. Microphone, and you'll get an extra rock to the head. So oh that's God. number one. I'm dying. Your last words into Mr. Microphone would be, please stop stoning me. And then the mic would go dead. So that's that's ironic. It's true. But, I mean, over in Gaza, they're not so big on you whipping out your microphone and lecturing them on women's rights or anybody's rights right. other or, than or those of Hamas. Rights or, yeah, queer rights or, you know, or yeah, whatever your pronouns should be. So that's the number one. Uh, number two, but but sort of bigger picture. OK, two things. A, I love it when progressives get bitten by their own snake. I love when their own people come after them. That is the, the only satisfying part about this chapter we're living in now is watching these older guys get chewed up and spit out by the groups that they essentially groomed and trained to take their place. They're attacking them. I love it. I I love it when, you know, the editor for the New York Times, who's been there for 30 years, gets fired because he let Tom Cotton do an op-ed by a bunch of 23-year-olds. That's yes. poetic to me, number one. Number two, her being assaulted. All right, this thing where everything is assault, you know, you have the president of the female soccer sp Spanish league now facing criminal charges for kissing a player in celebration on the podium because she was assaulted by him in a celebratory kiss, which lasted less than a second. All the assholes out there who decided to turn everything into assault are now going to sort of reap the rewards of that, which is now all you believe every woman, everything's assault. Anytime you touch somebody, it's an assault. There's no difference between rape or touching someone on the shoulder. Good. Now everything's assault. And now everyone's going to claim assault in every interaction now. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's gotten even worse. So this gal, the, the, the victim, the one who gets the invite, despite her terrible tweets or Instagram posts, she accepts the invite. And this, by the way, I just want to spend a minute on that. Why would he do that? He's trying to show like, oh, I still love you. You should love me. Be nice to me. He is not seeing the reality. This group, and she's affiliated with CARE, Council on, on American Islamic Hello. Relations, which is a nightmare too. They're, he's deluding himself. They're against you, bud, okay? They're against you, just as they're against most people on the right side of the aisle. Um, th there's no brooking a, 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 an agreement with this young woman or people in her palace or Students for Justice in Palestine group. They, as soon as they heard Chemerinsky, it was a done deal. And so he still invites her into his home. She accepts it. And then she stands up and does the thing. So now she's not only claiming assault, she's taken it next level. Here she is in a TikTok video going, she's upping the ante. Take a listen to her new account of what actually happened for the listening audience, all we saw was Chemerinsky's wife, Fisk is her last name, reach over. She, after telling her repeatedly to leave and her not leaving, which makes her a trespasser, the wife puts her hand on the on uh, Mala's like shoulder 
and then tries to grab the microphone and gets the microphone and they have a tug of war over the microphone. So now listen to the revisionist history on what happened. There is not an inappropriate time to talk about Palestine. There is a genocide going on. It is our collective responsibility to insert Palestine any and everywhere, whether it be in the workspace or our schools or even dinners. I said that and I started to talk about Ramadan when Professor Catherine Fisk, as you can tell from the video, came from where she was sitting on the upper tier of the courtyard and came down where I was standing on the steps and put her arms around me. She put her arms around me, grasped at my hijab, grasped at my breasts inappropriately, kept trying to grope my shirt, grabbed my phone and dragged me up the steps, grabbed my microphone and dragged me up the steps, and threatened to call the cops on a gathering of majority black and brown students. Professor Fist did not assault me because I was talking about Palestine. I didn't even get the chance to talk about Palestine. She assaulted me because to her, a hijabi wearing, kofia repping, Palestinian Muslim student that felt comfortable to speak in Arabic was enough of a threat to her that I was justified to be assaulted. It was the classic thing that Palestinian lives are constructed to be seen as allowed to be harmed, to be killed, and to be slaughtered, while white ones are allowed to live. Professor Fisk embodied the Islamophobia, the deep anti-Arab racism, and the deep anti-Palestinian sentiment that the Zionist administrations are built on. I have never in my life felt so traumatized and humiliated and been grabbed in that way in public. To that I say, any lawyer can tell you what Professor Fisk did was clear assault and battery. In fact, if I had chosen to act out, it would have been justified. It would be my legal right to have done and acted out in self-defense. But I knew that a white woman that was so perfect at acting like a victim would have spin the narrative to demonize me and point me as aggressive. I, wow. I, we're going to have to spend the next hour on this. There's there's a lot to I, go over. I like that it took the turn for the sexual when she was, oh, you know, oh. groping her breast. She groped the breast. Really? Yeah. Oh, Miss Fisk, who knew? So listen, let me yeah. add to that. Let me, look, here it is. Here it is. Groping of the breast. She's, she's yes. grabbing a boob there. I don't, I, I don't see a boob. I see a microphone in front of a boob that she's mm. got her hand on there. Um, but let me tell you, in case you were thinking about believing Mala Kafaya, um, let me give you her written addendum to what happened. There is a call to action. She is behind on Instagram and um, she wants them fired. Mala wants them fired for the crime of not wanting her to do this shit in their backyard. She is also, of course, still demanding divestment from Israel. But here is what the letter demands and says. Dear UC Board of Regents, President Michael Drake and UC Berkeley leadership, blah, 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 we're mad. We're demanding the removal and accountability of Erwin Chemerinsky and Berkeley Law Professor Catherine Fins Fisk. Listen to this, Adam. Fisk placed the student's head in a chokehold <laughs> and her hijab was tightened around her neck, impacting her ability to breathe. Can we please show it again? Let's see the headlock. Let's see the headlock that this, look at it. It's a headlock with her hand yeah. on the shoulder. That was it, I guess. I guess that was the headlock. We missed it when she placed the hand on the shoulder. Now they get into the tug of war over the microphone. And at no point is there anything resembling a headlock. Continuously, Professor Fisk grabbed the clothes of the student and touched her breasts and chest section inappropriately, twisting her shirt and her outerwear. We demand accountability for the violence and trauma inflicted upon our peers. Demand the resignation. No, no professor has harmed, uh, that has harmed a student should be granted the privilege of being allowed to teach, especially when Muslim and Palestinian students no longer feel safe in their presence. We demand complete punitive consequences for their assault and battery. And then they say, you've deliberately aligned yourself with violent systems of oppression, racism, and white supremacy, and the ongoing genocide of Palestinians in Gaza is no exception. 
and they have a bunch of demands, including the inclusion of a Palestine studies program aimed at exploring Palestinians' history of resistance and struggle toward the right of return and justice in a settler, settler colonial context. These people are insane. But let's just go back. In that TikTok and here, she's claiming groping of the breasts, inappropriate touching of the breasts and mid-region, and chokehold, hijab tighten. She's basically saying, she tried to strangle me, impacted my ability to breathe. She's what we used to call in the law, a fucking liar. Hmm. But is this so different than the first story we got into or the second story we got into about sort of the race hustling a Benjamin Crump, you know, um, right. mayor of Chicago, uh, AP News, CNN. Is this so different? Like, it's exactly the same story. It's a different group. It's a different group that's oppressed. It's more narrative. But what is different about her account of this and the mayor's account of what happened to that young black man who was shot by police officers? It's it's the same thing. It's a lie. It's a hustle. It's a victim mentality. It's based on... And by the way, you're trying to get the professor and his wife fired or you're trying to get cops fired or put in jail. It's it's the same hustle. It's the same thing. It's a different group, but all the elements are exactly the same. And thank God on in each instance they were filming, because re if you remove the video from both of those interactions, young black man and cops or crazy Mrs. Microphone with the hijab, and we're just going her word versus the word of the professor, we're in a pickle as a society at this point. This young woman is so far gone. You, like the number of things she raised, I, I kept notes just so we could talk about them. You must insert Palestine everywhere. There's no inappropriate time or place to discuss Palestine. You could be at your friend's mom's funeral. You will get up there in front of the dead body and you will make the case for genocide in Gaza. You got it? That's number one. Um, breasts grabbed a lie and, and over-exaggeration, of course. It was the hijab and my speaking in Arabic that really upset Professor Fisk. It wasn't the fact that I hijacked her nice event in her backyard to which she invited me and I accepted, and she gave me food. She literally was catering to me. That's, she was literally, but she hated me, you see, and she hated my hijab, not my interruption. Um, only whites' lives matter. We've How many times have we heard that? Only whites are allowed to live, she says there. She's an Islamophobe. She hates me because of these things. And she's white. Did I mention how white she is? Catherine Fisk is white. So is Erwin Chemerinsky. This young lady, Mala, really wants us to remember that. Um, I'm traumatized. I'm humiliated. I almost died by my choke out. <laughs> I'm the new George Floyd, basically, is what she's trying to get to. I'm just like him. And I had a legal right to attack her when she placed hands on me. And I would like you to know, Adam, because while this young lady appears to be just a law student, I actually graduated from law school and passed the bar. In fact, passed the bar in three different states and went on to practice for a decade. And I would like to let her know about a little thing that's called trespassing. Because once someone tells you to leave their property, you have no right to remain there. And they are allowed, under the law, to use a reasonable amount of force to eject you from the property if they perceive a threat, which this couple accurately did, given your bizarre, lunatic-like behavior. She had every right to place her hands on you. That is not assault or battery. And your trespassing changed the game to begin with. For the record, California Penal Code assault is an unlawful attempt along with the present ability to cause violent injury to another. No one thinks Catherine Fisk attempted to cause violent injury to you, madam. Battery, unwarranted application of force to another. Once again, it was not unwarranted. You were in the wrong. She's not playing the victim. You, you are the victim. And Adam, this is a playbook. It's a playbook where you are rude, you're entitled, you're coddled, then you become 
a fake victim when somebody calls you out on your nonsense and you engage in self-aggrandizement, right? Like, oh, I was so brave to do what I did, but poor me, they came for me. And you add in some lies to try to ruin the, vic- the real victim's life. And now we're in the phase of trying to get the real victim fired, publicly shamed, and the cherry on top of the Sunday, new courses devoted to the plight of the Palestinians at UC Berkeley. This is, a, this is like pathological. This, this person, maybe she is gonna pass the bar exam. Maybe she's actually gonna become a lawyer. Maybe she'll work at CARE, which is the only place she belongs. But there are a lot more just like her because at least 10 people in that one gathering alone walked out with her. One of whom we heard on that tape who happened to be black. And I don't think that's an accident because this whole thing has boiled down to black, white, brown, white. Yes. Uh, Well, as I like to say, all roads lead to narcissism. So we're raising a bunch of crazed narcissists. You can't do this unless you're an insane narcissist. Stand up at some function. It would have been unthinkable, especially at a professor's house when you were a student. Uh, The dean. One day, yes, one day we will dedicate two hours to the self-esteem movement and how it's gone horribly, horribly wrong. And this is the manifestation of that. On the other hand, I still want that Mr. Microphone because I would keep that thing in my back pocket. And any time I had a gripe, like if I was at a Chipotle and they charged me five bucks for guacamole, (laughs) I would just whip that thing out and hold court to everybody in that place. (laughs) You support genocide. Yeah, I would I would talk about the genocide of Palestinians first, and then I would get into the gouging of the guacamole. Can you imagine? I mean, this really would be the move. This would be like the counter move. Maybe maybe you walk around with your own Mr. Microphone and when she starts talking about that shit, you get into October 7th or you talk about like the yes. the crazy radical Islamist attacks on American uh, Americans yeah. all over, including what about California. Munich, ninth, yes, Munich, do this. Come on, bitch, go, keep girl. it coming. I got Mr. Microphone. <laughs> that... That would be the real power move there. Um, if I were Catherine Fisk, I would sue her. I would sue her for these lies that she's publicly telling about me, these defamatory statements. They're obviously not true, and they are being done with malice, even though Catherine's not a public figure, so that wouldn't need to be proved. And I think I'd go after her with both guns blazing. But Catherine Fisk will not do it, and neither will Erwin Chemerinsky. They will not fight back by using the legal tools available to them, like going after her for trespass and for defamation, because they have been themselves woke warriors who, as you pointed out at the top, helped create this situation. Erwin Chemerinsky caught on tape here in this clip that's resurfaced, talking about the hiring process of faculty at UC Berkeley. And keep in mind when you listen to this, it is illegal to use racial preferences in hiring. People forget that, but it is. And he knows that because he's what again? The dean of the law school. Listen. But if ever I'm deposed, I'm gonna deny I said this to you. Um, When we do faculty hiring, we're quite conscious that diversity is important to us. And we say diversity is important, it's fine to say that. But I'm very careful when we have a faculty appointments committee meeting. Anytime somebody says, you know, we should really prefer this candidate over this candidate because this person would add diversity, don't say that. You can think it, you can vote it, but our discussions are not privileged. So don't ever articulate that that's what you're doing. So break the law, but be smart enough to stay quiet about it. Got it? That's from the dean of law. He should be fired for that reason alone. Here's the wife. Yes in an interview when she gets the job. My whole family history is Berkeley. I turned down Harvard and Yale and Stanford to come here. I was thrilled. I love the university and what it stands for. The camp, now that's the end of the quote. The article goes on. The campus's long tradition of activism was another lure to Professor Fisk. As a student, Fisk and her peers organized the first Berkeley Women's Law Journal, and they protested the tenure denial of two especially fabulous women professors, both of whom are now Emirata. You have to, this is a quote, you have to mobilize student, staff, or faculty activism and use that energy 
to make a better place, she said, Adam. Okay, there you're looking at it in the face, Catherine. There's your student activism, face to face. Then finally, we've got um, one reason I came back as faculty to Berkeley is because of its longstanding commitment to scholarly rigor that's also policy driven to advance the cause of social justice. They've been railing about BLM and not just George Floyd, Michael Brown as recently as two years ago, who we all know was another guy who brought on his own death by going for and attempting to attack a cop. So this is the world they've created and there it was in their own backyard. So will they change? You think they get it now? No, I don't, but it's not so unlike sanctuary cities or defund the police. So the same 10 cent head yentas are screaming about defunding the police and then the cops pull back and then the criminals come in and then they get carjacked and they want to know where the cops are. And now they think it's a bad idea. And think about all the rhetoric about sanctuary cities. Nobody's illegal. Everyone's welcome. Everyone has a seat at the table. And then the buses start pulling up and the Guatemalans start climbing out of it and they start screaming, what are we supposed to do? We can't accommodate these people. We have our own citizens with their own problems. They say one thing and are immediately attacked by it. Like it turns on them just that fast. So whether it's whatever this idiot's saying about diversity or defund the police or sanctuary cities, it's all the same. It's just, I make a proclamation that makes me sound like a hero and then it blows up in my face shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. I think that Berkeley Law School should do to this student what Vanderbilt did to those morons who stormed the chancellor's office and allegedly assaulted cops on, uh, on campus. They should expel her. She should be expelled, not only for yeah. the breaking the law by trespassing uh, on the dean's property, but for her obvious lies and vicious defamation of some of two people they claim to respect, their dean and his wife. There, there's one more clip from this young woman who gave an interview to Fox News, once again, exaggerating her alleged injuries. Take a listen here. We thought Sot that 16. this dinner was, you know, um, a kind of disgusting and extravagant and lavish um, display of wealth that was already being funneled using our tuition money for this genocide. So that had always been the plan. Um, we had even done a criminal defense consult with the National Lawyers Guild who, you know, pretty much thought this was a pretty low risk action. She kept on grabbing inappropriately at my breast um, and kept grabbing in my shirt area, trying to tug and pull. And I was in pain and I was scared. She was in pain. She was in pain and scared as she was about to become the next George Floyd. I mean, they should expel these two, this, this woman. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, not for them, but for those who come after them. At some point, some message is going to need to be sent to the lunatics, which is you cannot take over the asylum. Like she needs to be expelled because she, it, you know, she she earned it and she made her bed. But it, it's for me, it's not so much for her. It's for all those who will attempt the same thing in, in infinitum. It's just going to keep. It's just going to keep going. And so somebody's going to need to be the adult in the room and send a message. And yes, she needs to be expelled. Mm. All right, last last one. There's a big lawsuit happening over in Australia, and it's important. Uh, it has to do with what is a woman. So there's this all female website, um, and it's called Giggle, and it's an app exclu exclusively for women. An Australian businesswoman named uh, Sal Grover set it up just for women in 2020 to find a roommate or organize social meetups. Um, apparently, lesbians use it as a dating site, but the point is, it's just for the ladies. And it says that. It says it's for females only. Well, on cue, you know what happened. A man pretending to be a woman uh, decided to sign up and try to use it. 
And apparently the website Giggle has biometric gender verification software. And I'm telling you, men are going to have to start using this shit in bars. Um, mm. That determines whether the person is in fact female. Although I think hmm, maybe you just needed eyes to, to know this. Yeah, Stevie Wonder <laughs> could have figured out this is a dude. <laughs> Just gonna say, I'm not, not sure the biometric detector was necessary. And this fake woman, you can't make it up, is named Roxy Tickle. Her, his mm -hmm. name is Roxy Tickle. So mm -hmm. Tickle is now suing Giggle over the fact that Tickle got bounced as a fake woman. He, mm -hmm. when he got bounced, to me, this looks like harassment. He started calling and text and texting and messaging Sal Grover's personal mobile. She blocked him. Then he filed a complaint with their human rights commission over there. And then of course came the lawsuit. And now they're having this hearing and they are awaiting a ruling. It was a one day hearing that happened on, uh, was it yesterday? And uh, he uh, is going after her and he is demanding that he, because he is legally permitted to identify as a female, be allowed on the damn Giggle app. And they have had to, she, Sal Grover, has had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the definition of what is a woman. And only at one point was a settlement offered by Roxy Tickle, and it would have required a payment in addition to Sal Grover, the woman, attending a gender identity re-education camp of some sort mm. and opening up the Giggle app to males. She refused and now she's going through this big process and here's how the spectator describes the stakes. If Roxy Tickle wins, it will establish that males have a legal right, not just to the female sex category, but to all female spaces, including hospital wards, sports facilities, domestic violence, refuges, rape crisis centers, and prisons across Australia. So what do you think? And um, do you think it's likely to go the right way over in Australia, which has gotten fairly woke? Yeah, they're maybe ahead of Canada. Um, all right, well, this story's, confusing because Sal is a female and Roxy <laughs> is a dude. So it's going to be hard. And it's true. You got to hold on. You know, I, 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 but I don't know if you're like me, but my mind starts to swim with a lot of the transgender stuff, especially when you read it through like the LA times, because it'll be a guy who goes into a Denny's bathroom and rapes a nine-year-old girl, except for the guy identifies as a female. So it'll, and her pronouns are they. So it'll go like they, she went into the bathroom and then they pulled out their phallus. And then she proceeded to rape the female with her penis and then they, and I'm like, I, okay, is this a gang rape? Is this a chick? Is this a dude? Right. I don't know what's going on anymore because you guys won't label anything anymore because you're, you're worried about offending a phallic. Okay, fine. So it all gets confusing because of the nomenclature. Um, look, Women and women's advocates and Madonna and all the other 10 cent heads or the tip of the spear for all the, you know, okay, there was a million women at a, at a march when Trump got elected. Where are they on this subject? Yeah. Where are they in women's sports being destroyed by men? Where are the women's rights advocates when it comes to things like this being destroyed? Uh, they're nowhere to be found because they're hypocrites and they're cowards, but they should be the ones that are speaking out against this stuff. Not you or whoever's on uh, Fox network. They should be the tip of the spear for pushing back against these things. Um, unfortunately, circling back to the Berkeley story, they created this environment and now they're being eaten up by this environment. They 
were the ones that's, that created this group and that group and this group only and black graduations and black dorms and, you know, uh, LGBT day and month and all this kind of stuff. They're the ones who tried to segregate everybody and now they're being infiltrated by their own. And so ultimately they deserve it, but they being women's advocates should be the ones that are speaking out. And when they do like JK Rowling's, they get shouted down. So oh, yeah. ladies, uh, if you claim to love ladies, then speak up on behalf of ladies, not crazy men who are pretending to be ladies. Or your daughter's going to walk into a restroom in Australia, but it's happening here, of course, all the time too, and see this guy posing as a woman. Here he is in SOT 19. Roxy, you're a transgender woman from regional New South Wales. You played Yikes. hockey for 10 years from when you were 16 years old, but you stopped when you were 26. Why? Something didn't feel quite right. I really didn't like being in the male changing rooms. They were, I felt really uncomfortable there. I didn't like the, the smells or the sounds. Look at the reaction shots of the other women, the actual women in that audience, Adam. Talk about side anyway. eye. Yeah, well, Roxy's nuts. And everyone knows it and we can't say anything because we have to pretend like this is a real movement and these people aren't batshit crazy. I mean, a significant number of these people are just people that are in mental anguish, pure yes. and simple. And we treat it like it's some sort of bloodborne disease or something like I'm a woman trapped inside a man's body. No, you're not. You're a victim. And now you need therapy. That's it. Good luck. That's the overwhelming majority of these people are people that need help, not people that are spearheading a movement because this is an actual biological event that is going on with them. But that is the narrative that we created. So when nut jobs come along, we cannot offer any counter argument to that because we already signed off on the insane premise that this was an actual thing like, you know, cancer or COPD or hepatitis B. We just signed off on it. The medical community got on board because they're cowards as well. Academia got on board with it. All the progressive politicians got on board with it. And now when nut jobs come along, we all have to pretend like it's real. To your point, this is why Kelly J. Keene, who's a very strong and wonderful, brilliant activist on this, on the right side, she says, this is one of the many reasons why you can't engage in the pronoun game. Because how do you make the argument, she can't come into the women's locker room. She can't join Giggle. She can't play female sports. That you're, you've already lost you know, before you've even right. gotten into the substance of it. And it's, it's such a good point. And it's one of the things that changed my own views on the, the pronouns. Here is Sal Grover, the woman who started Giggle. Reasons for female-only spaces have not gone away. So we should not be in a position to have to justify them. I'm sick of ex like when people go, but why do you need a female-only space? Because we want them. That's enough for me. We we do not have to relive the trauma we have gone through at the hands of men every time we want to de like defend why we want to be away from them occasionally. Just have a refuge away from you, whether it's online or in real life. Yes. I, like, I need your, I need like, I need the finances. I need the help. The only way I can repay you, other than like just my endless gratitude, is let's go and get our rights back. Like let's just use it, get our rights back, and end this madness so we can all move on with our lives. Mm, well said. Mm. It's true. Like because we want it. Shut up, get out. If you don't like the men's room because it smells, then don't go. I don't figure something out. It's not my problem. Yeah, no, I completely concur. And we've started to sort of bend society because we want, if one person feels uncomfortable or if one person, it's the same way I feel about ordering lunch when you're on set of a movie or a TV show. Get the beef, get the brisket, get the turkey. And then someone goes, well, the crazy hairdresser lady's vegan. What do we do about her? My answer is tough shit. Pack a lunch, bitch. That's your yes. problem. Yes. <laughs> Not my problem. 
Yes, this is the problem. Well, I'm hopefully going to be speaking with Sal. I really want to talk to her because this is a landmark case in Australia. And, you know, we're going through the same thing here. By the way, if you want to help her on this whole fight, there's a Giggle crowdfunding website here. I'm trying to pull it up. It's giggle.crowdfund.com. Join this landmark fight to reclaim sex-based rights and protections for all women and girls. Uh, she's already had to pay, I think, at least half a million dollars in this whole, just just the, you know, the lawsuit is the punishment already, right? Even if they don't, this wasn't like Google. This is just a startup app where women could go. So she's not a rich person. She needs some help. So it's giggle.crowdfund.com. All right, now, you have to the, spend uh, a minute on- The fellas yeah, at a crowdfunding site called ticklemyrocks.com. <laughs> so you could go there and raise some money for his legal defense. He doesn't have any rocks anymore. He went to full Megillah. No more All rocks. Right. Got news for us. Sorry, Roxy. Doesn't make you, doesn't make you a woman. Um, so we're we're stars now. I mean, you're making a, a a star out of me, Adam Carolla, because we are gonna be starring along with an amazing, amazing cast in this series that's coming out in the Daily Wire called Mr. Burcham. And it's based on this shop teacher that Adam has created in his own mind. And he's been doing this bit for years. And now his life comes to the screen in Mr. Burcham. I'm gonna show them the trailer and then you and I can talk about it. Here it is. All right. Tell me what you need. Jump into the first one. Rolling, speed, action. Sawbuck's looking a little chubby wubby. So I bought him some new food. It's organic and vegan. <sighs> Dogs are supposed to eat meat. They're descendants of wolves. You ever see a vegan wolf on the Nature Channel? I'm a vegan. <laughs> Coffee is for closers, ladies. Listen up. Hey, don't make this a prison hug. Don't do anything stupid. Earth than last year. I'm a heteronormative, cisgendered white male. For which I apologize. I'm black, and that used to be enough, but I'm also bilingual, and I'm non-binary. We're the Army! We drink more before 9 a.m. than you Navy pukes do all day! He rubbed all the fur off his emotional support ferret. The damn thing looked like a four-legged penis! Charity and work. Two words that should never go together. Like women and opinions. I want a burly man. They're salty and make me dizzy. Sorry, just need to find a thingy to fix my gaming chair. When I was on the construction site, my chair was a five-gallon bucket. It was also my toilet. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be so fun. You got to subscribe to The Daily Wire to actually watch it. People will love it. Coming out soon, but... Are you excited about this? Because this is like so many big stars there who came together to make this thing real. Yeah, uh, this thing's about 30 years in the making. I started my radio career by creating this character called uh, Mr. Burcham so many years ago. Um, I was teaching boxing and I did a morning stunt with Jimmy Kimmel where he was going to box Michael, the maintenance man. And it was one of those morning show stunt things. And then, uh, you know, Jimmy and I became friends and I told him I wanted to get into radio. And he told me I had to come up with a character. So I invented this character, which is amalgamation of all the shop teachers I had in junior high who hated the kids and who love woodworking, they love metalworking, they love the idea of shop class, they just didn't like the idea of kids being in their shop class. So I created this character, became popular, and then it just kind of floated around. And we did the pilot for Fox about 11 or 12 years ago, but it was before it's time, I'll say about 11 or 12 years ago, and Fox decided to focus on Bob's Burgers and whatever other crap they were trying to put out. But at some point, it found a home at uh, Daily Wire, which I'm elated about because it's really the first project I ever did in show business. What, what do you mean? You, you did No Safe Space, you've been a movie star. Yeah, I'm saying the the first thing I ever did was Mr. Burcham. Oh, I see. It, this project was the it. first. I got yes. it. I got it. Yes. I got it. Well, you made me you made me join later. their union in order to participate in this. So I'm like a real I feel like Norma Ray now, Adam. Thanks to you. 
well, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but, you know, I figured if I can get you to be my animated wife, that's one step closer to reality. <laughs> Are, are we gonna are we gonna have any like bedroom scenes? Our characters should I be worried? <laughs> I'm working on some right now. I've been uh, I've been working the beats out in my head, but I'm gonna put them down on paper real soon. <laughs> and yeah, and the thing about animation is they can't just draw it out of whole cloth. They have to physically witness you. So <laughs> just be prepared. We'll be wearing body suits. It's gonna be tasteful. It'll be classy. <laughs> Now there's a tease. Adam Carolla, thank you so much. And go check out more from Adam at adamcarolla.com. What a, what a fun way to end the week. On Monday, Alan Dershowitz and Arthur Idala will be here with all things Trump as that trial gets underway. Have a great weekend, everyone.